Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bokor, the host for episode 41. Thank you very much for taking the time to join me on this episode. I've got a few stories to talk about. Let me get right into that. Well, first story is kind of big news for us Canadians here. We've, uh, I think a lot of you know, we've been following the show and, and looking at news that we just announced. Our federal government had announced a national EV incentive program for here in Canada that would, that would take effect for this year. Well, it actually, uh, the announcement came out the other day that it's going to start on May the 1st of this year, so only in a couple of weeks. And this is the very first program that we've had in the history of Canada that's a, a national in scope, uh, which means that even if you live in a province that has EV incentives, you will still be able to qualify for a federal or potentially qualify for a federal incentive to add to that. And for those provinces like here in Ontario, where we lost our pretty lucrative incentive last year, which was really helping, by the way, to spur the adoption. Um, now we'll be able to have something to, to move forward with for people considering an EV purchase. So basically, uh, I won't get into a lot of the gritty details, but the main uh, levels of the incentive are twofold. One of them is a $5,000 incentive for a battery electric, a hydrogen fuel cell, uh, or a longer range plug-in hybrid electric vehicle you get $5,000 flat. And for shorter range plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, you can get up to, you can get $2,500. And how this is zeroed in is for the $5,000 uh, incentive, it, a vehicle that, that has six seats or fewer, where the base model trim is uh, less than 45,000 MSRP. So whatever, so let's say the Kona EV as an example, the base model trim is less than 45,000, that will qualify for $5,000. And any higher price versions of that same uh, model, any higher price trim versions of that same model will be eligible as well, up to a maximum, if the, the MSRP for that trim is up to uh, $55,000, which is the cap. And that's for a vehicle with six seats or fewer. Um, so you know, there's a lot of, uh, vehicles that qualify and I'll put that up in behind me in a sec also if you have a seven seat or greater vehicle not very many that are greater than seven nowadays but it's possible where the base MSRP is less than fifty five thousand dollars then you'll qualify for the five thousand dollars and again within that trim level of that vehicle if if another trim level takes you up to a maximum of sixty thousand you'll still be eligible for that five thousand uh, dollar incentive uh, it and it excludes freight delivery, all other fees, colors, add-on accessories, all that stuff. They don't care. You can option it, this right out the the window, and as long as that base MSRP and that model, uh, the the base model starts at forty below forty five thousand, and then if you trim it up to fifty five on on a regular vehicle, uh, six passenger or less, then you'll qualify. So does they don't really care about options and you'll qualify for that $5,000. Now, this program starts on May the 1st of this year. It's only in a couple of weeks. Detail, full details will be available on the Transport Canada website, so I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for that so you can check it out. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of back and forth comments on this, and I think I mentioned this in a previous show. There is a business, by the way, uh, portion to this, which I won't get into. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, check out the website, but that's good to help spur uh, businesses and municipal fleets and so forth. Uh, there are there are limits, of course, on this for them, but it's good to see that, uh, that they're included, uh, things like tax write-offs and so forth. So a lot of people are upset because Tesla's not, a, not doesn't make the list again. Uh, just like in you know, the Ontario incentive, when they changed it, they dropped Tesla, then they were able to put them back on and so forth. So it's been up and down. Um, I think 45000 is a fair price. 45000 Canadian is a lot of money. Uh, the average car here is, you know, $22,000 or so, 25000 So forty five is a steep price for a car. Remember, Tesla competes in the luxury brand. Now, there are others on the list that compete in luxury brands as well, more so on the plug-in hybrid side than the full battery electric. Yeah, you'll see as, as I put up the lists here for the cars that qualify uh, and what the, the pricing of vehicles are right now. I think it's a fair price, and I think the government needs to just draw a line and, and put a stake in the sand and say this is where we're going to start it, and this is where we're going to incentivize people to get into uh, electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles in this case as well. Um, so, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get some comments about, yeah, it's not a good program. It is a good program. Whatever your opinions are, I respect those. But this, what, what this is doing is two things. One, it's creating a national awareness about electric vehicles, specifically in places where there really wasn't any, any 
awareness to begin with. And I know that a lot of the other provinces, especially in the mid mid parts of Canada and some of the eastern provinces, don't have very good charging infrastructure as an example. However, for, this will create awareness for people that want maybe an EV as a secondary car or as a primary vehicle for urban driving that, you know, a couple hundred kilometers or less in a day is more than, than they'll need and they can charge at home. This is going to help get those people into into electric vehicles. And as you know, educating minds one tailpipe at a time is what I'm about and trying to get people away from tailpipes into zero emission vehicles because that's the ultimate goal. doesn't matter what they drive, what brand, what model, whatever, as long as they're driving something at zero emissions and the energy that that they're using to, to charge that vehicle is coming from, from clean as clean sources as we can get it. So no coal and all this kind of stuff. It's a twofold story. So I think this incentive is very good. And I really hope it's, it, you know, because of the awareness it's now creating, a lot of people are going to go after it and use this as a stepping stone into EVs where they might not have fought a year ago, six months ago, especially in other parts of Canada that didn't have this incentive. So say what you say, um, you know, there's a lot of vehicles that do qualify. It's unfortunate that Tesla doesn't. But Tesla has the power to change their pricing anytime they want to. And they've already cut the base model of the Model 3 and opted for the standard uh, range plus instead of just the standard range. So they've already upped their pricing from what they said, what initially it came out. And when it initially came out, it was not that far off from the $45,000 mark, folks. So if Tesla feels that this is going to help them sell more Model 3s in Canada at a base, then maybe they'll, they'll do something to justify to lower the price. But they don't have to because they're selling quite well anyway. So I think this, you know, people that are going to complain that Tesla is excluded, it's a moot point because they're doing quite fine, quite well with sales. And It'll, it'll be up to them if they want to, again, modify the pricing because they have the power to do that. It's a little bit different for some of the bigger guys. And hopefully this will get dealer excitement as well. So kind of the third part then about getting the dealers, some of their staff excited about pushing EVs because we talked about this before. Walk into a dealership and nine, nine out of ten of them don't really want to sell you an EV. They'll, they'll redirect you into something else that they want to sell that's on the lot or an SUV or whatever the case may be. So hopefully this will get dealers excited and want to start, you know, uh, understanding EVs better so they can explain it to people that are coming in and be able to sell it accordingly and appropriately and size size the vehicle for the right buyer. Right. I talked about that before. So it's all good. Thank you, Canada. This thing starts May 1st. We'll see what happens. I'll keep a track on this and, and I'm sure some stats are going to come out. Now, we do have a federal national election coming up uh, this fall. So our government, current government could change uh, and there's rumblings about that. So who knows if this program will last, will have any legs. Right now it's a three-year program. Uh, there's a fund in it and it's a first come, first serve basis. So once that money runs out, then it's out. That's how, how it is right now, unless the government adds more to the pot. Um, there's no information as far as how consumers will receive the rebate, whether it will be applied to the dealer. So the dealer will actually get the rebate and apply or that incentive and apply it at the purchase a time of purchase of sale of the vehicle. Um, or if a check would be mailed to the consumer, like we had in Ontario, as an example. Well, it actually went both ways here in Ontario. We're not sure. I'm not sure in the details yet on that. Still waiting to find out. We should know. I should know everything by the end of the month. Uh, the, the government said that they will release all the details by April 30th. But it's, again, all good news. Hopefully this will help kickstart Canada because we've been slowing down a little bit on our EV adoption. Quebec is going gangbusters. BC is... Uh, is still doing okay, but we need the rest of Canada to to start looking at EVs more seriously. Even though with all the controversy about pipelines and oil and gas, I get it. I know the economies. Oil and gas isn't going anywhere for quite some time. It's going to be around for a long time, but we need to do our little parts to try to change consumer transport away from fossil fuels into clean energy and into zero emission vehicles. So stay tuned and let's see how this program goes. So I've been talking about Kia a lot, as you guys know, and one of the problems that they're experiencing with building such a good product in the new 20 model year Kia Soul, which is uh, hasn't started shipping yet or will be very shortly. And of course, the Kia, the Kia Nero EV, which is selling like hotcakes, is that they have a supply and demand problem. <laughs> they can't supply enough for the demand. Well, a news article came out that Kia is looking to maybe uh, expand their uh, manufacturing plants into other areas. Right now, um, South Korea is the main hub for all their um, vehicles made under the Nero, Optima, and Seoul brands. And these include the hybrids and electrics are all made in South Korea and they are shipped globally. So that is a constraint issue. So Kia has a plant in Slovakia 
and they may leverage that to supply European markets because we know that there's been big demand, especially for the Nero EV in Europe. It's been it's been really really selling well, and a lot of reservations happening. Um, now it's there's information coming from Kia that they want to sell um, that they need to sell 32,000 electric vehicles every year starting from 2021 to comply with the EU's emission regulations. So there's definitely motivation for Kia to do something about this and to increase production, not just because the demand is there and then and the demand could be greater. Kia is being pressured by the EU to cut its fleet average of CO2 emissions to 94 uh, grams per kilogram per kilometer. Sorry if I've got that correct by 2021 uh, and something you can only do by selling more plugins. So the Slovakia plant, uh, it, it's well, re well received and positioned within the European marketplace to do this. It's also uh, close to a lot of battery suppliers like LG and SK Innovation, which work with Kia today in supplying battery uh, cells for their vehicles. These companies are, are eyeing production in Eastern Europe. And uh, we know that their production constraints for battery packs uh, have hampered sales for other brands, including Volvo, which just can't get enough. So. Um, there's no talk about if Kia wants to do a similar action in North America, uh, i.e. like VW has done where they announced the Chattanooga plant for their production of EVs in North America, but we'll have to wait and see. There is a Georgia assembly plant for Kia already in existence. They build Optima midsize sedans, the Sorento SUVs, and new eight passenger and the new the brand new eight passenger uh, Telluride, which is a really nice vehicle. Too bad it's not electric. It would give I think it would give uh, Rivian a run for its money anyway. But uh, it's a nice vehicle. So stay tuned. Um, it's good news that Kia is thinking about this. I really hope they move quick because we want to see their product out on the streets, out on the roads, and display placing tailpipes with their zero emission products. They're really good products. Um, you know, so many reviews now on the Soul, the Nero, uh, every one that I read is very, very positive. Um, you know, nothing's perfect, but they are very good, solid products. So um, I'll continue to follow this. And if I get more information, I'll let you all know. Now, also staying with Kia, there's just a quick unveil that they did at the New York Auto Show recently for something they called the Haba Nero. Um, Boy, that's an interesting name. I don't know what that means. Somebody put in the comments what they think a habanero means. It's it's got to be meaning for something Korean for something. I don't know, uh, but it's a cool little uh, dual motor all wheel drive four seater with a range of about three hundred miles. I'm sure that this is WLTP that they're. Uh, referencing or 483 kilometers but it, it's really kind of a compact commuter car uh, and the, the, there's not much information out there uh, other than some pictures that I'm putting up here you know 300 plus miles of range uh, again probably WLTP that uh, doesn't say EPA so I'll, I'll assume on the on the worst case dual motor all-wheel drive um, with uh, some other specs not really much no pricing no timeline uh, again, just it's it's nice to see these concepts come out because, as I mentioned before in previous shows, a lot of what you see in design and engineering and, and direction that uh, manufacturers take from concepts go into production vehicles later on. So uh, it's a cute little car. It doesn't say what markets it's going for. I'm, I'm guessing that it's going to be a global market. It's not just because uh, there's a lot of announcements coming out which are specifically targeted for China that I'm not reporting on. A lot of brands that are that are producing vehicles just for that market. I always try to want to keep everything more global on my show, and uh, you know China is is a substantial huge market on its own, which bodes another show. And I hope somebody out there, maybe in YouTube land, wants to start just following the Chinese market and reporting on that from EV. They will have stories every day to talk about. There's a lot going on there. So interesting. Keep your eye on on this Kia product, and we'll see if that kind of makes it down into a production within the next, uh, you know, year or two years. Now, Mitsubishi. I mentioned the Outlander, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, a little while ago on a previous show that it's doing quite well. Well, they've actually surpassed the two hundred thousand global sale mark, and that's quite an achievement for something that most people probably don't even know is selling decently. When you, that's a pretty good number for a plug-in hybrid electric. Um, it's actually the highest result among plug-in hybrids uh, as far as sales go. It's offered in more than 50 countries and Europe is, is leading where it's sold the most with over 130,000 vehicles that are sold. U.S. Uh, is probably approaching about 5,000 of those. Um, so not a lot, about 300 a month, I guess, um, that, that these things have been selling. Um, I spoke to somebody just the other night. I was at a, uh, a an EV meeting and uh, talking to people, and, and the uh, couple guys have the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, and they love it. Um, it's got decent range. 
Uh, I think uh, ideally it's you know anywhere from 40 to 60 kilometers. It might be slightly higher. Good for just you know a, a commuting daily range. And if you need you know you've got your engine, if you need to go farther than that, and a lot of people can stay within that range and, and just constantly drive on on uh, on zero emissions on just recharging the battery at night. So I'm glad to see Mitsubishi's doing well. I know that it was doing really well here in Ontario before incentives very uh, went away, and let's hope that they continue uh, manufacturing these and. Uh, and continue to advertise it. I have started to see some ads show up here and there, which is good news as well. So as you folks know, another manufacturer I've been following is Sono Motors. Sono Motors um, I actually was in Germany, did a uh, kind of impression review a few months ago, and I've been reporting on them ever since. Well, uh, they sent me some press release material the other day about uh, big announcements that they finally selected where they're going to manufacture their Sono Scion. Um, so this is a German provider, of course, Sono Motors, but they're going to be manufacturing these in Sweden at the uh, Trollhattan uh, by a company called National Electric Vehicle Sweden, or NEVS. Uh, it's the same guys that used to build Saab, uh, great cars as well, if a lot of people remember those. Now, uh, some good information that came out of this announcement is that Sono Motors plans to do um, to build 260,000 vehicles initially um, over an eight-year period. Uh, they want to do want to start production in the second half of 2020 and I remember I mentioned that a few shows ago and then after a ramp up period they want to get to a clip rate of about 43,000 units a year and they're going to um, be manufactured out of this plant in two shift operations. So congratulations on Sonos for getting everything in order to start making the progress towards production um, and you know they, they finalized their production design they've you know really really looks a lot better than it did uh, in my opinion, when I when I did the impression review a few months ago, they've really cleaned it up, um, made it look much more, uh, much more you know, urbanish and just much more you know uh, nice lines and design language there. So good on Sonos, and I'm very, uh, I know they've got almost 10,000 reservations for this so far. So let's hope that more people jump on and uh, they will continue to take reservations and make more announcements. I'm sure as we get closer to production, and they'll probably continue another roadshow series like they were doing before. So congratulations, and keep keep watching Sonos for more activity coming from them. Now, staying in Europe, I'm going to talk about VW quickly because uh, almost a show can't go by without me saying something about VW. Well, at uh, one of the recent shows, they announced a another ID platform for that lineup called the Rooms, R O O M double Z or double Z, depending on what side of the pond and border you're on. Electric full SUV, or they call it an SUV. It does more, look more like an SUV than I think the Cross does. Um, now they're boasting that this is going to be a three row. Uh, SUV, um, so it'll have that third row at least as an option, and it's bigger than the ID Cross, but it's still based on that MEB platform, which I've talked to death about, so I don't need to go there anymore. Um, as I mentioned, it's a three-row CD configuration with a dual motor, uh, so giving it all-wheel drive, and a system output of 302 horsepower or 225 kilowatts of power, give it acceleration of zero to 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour of 6.6 .6 seconds so decent for a heavier suv a little larger vehicle and a top speed regulated at 180 kilometers per hour or 112 miles per hour which would be disappointing to the autobahn folks but that's a hey, 180 is pretty quick enough when you're allowed to go that fast more importantly um the rooms is powered by the an 82 kilowatt hour battery pack which estimated range right now is 450 kilometers or 280 miles under WLTP. So I suspect that EPA will be probably closer to the 250 mile mark. Uh, so whatever that is in kilometers, the, the high 300s so along those range or to uh, 370 or something like that, 380. Um, so let's wait and see what actually comes out there. Now this is uh, to start production in 2020. And in fact, VW is is all their production dates start next year in that magical year, which is 2020. Uh, all the three models, their ID, the rooms, the Cross, and the Compact ID. Um, now, in this article, they're mentioning that all those are all those three models will be sold globally. I thought that the ID was initially going to be a European under the Neo brand, but we'll have to wait and see. I really hope that 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 hatch, that four-door hatch, comes here because that's going to do really well in North America. So I'm hoping that it comes here. So we'll have to wait and see. But hey, more good news from VW, and uh, I'll keep following them because there's a lot of stuff going on from them. Quick announcement from Audi, or Audi. Sorry, I've got to pronounce it correctly. I got corrected on one of the last comments. Audi. I will get there, folks. Trust me, I'll keep practicing. Uh, called the AIME, Electric 
electric autonomous concept vehicle. Um, some de debut shots were, were given out by uh, Audi earlier this week. Um, it's an all electric autonomous concept car that'll have level four autonomy functionality powered by a 64 kilowatt hour battery pack with uh, a 125 kilowatt single electric motor. I'm not reading that this is all wheel drive. Um, and it's designed for highways and specially equipped areas within inner cities. And I've talked about autonomy before and why I think it's going to take us a long time to get to full autonomy, because it's not just the smarts that the vehicle itself has with sensors and, and compute power and all this, all this kind of stuff, telemetry that it gathers. But in order really for full autonomy to be effective, they need to be connected. And you've heard, you've probably seen some stuff about connected networks and connected vehicles and so forth. That's where the really secret sauce and the magic has to happen. When all these vehicles are on the road and they're all connected, then, you know, at very, very fast speeds through, um, through how co computers work, um, they, can, they can make judgments, they can see where others are, and they can take actions accordingly, most likely faster than we can from a human reaction point of view. But until that point, I still think full autonomy is, is, is a bit scary because there's, you know, humans are unpredictable and we can do dumb things sometimes while we're driving that don't make any sense. And it's hard to, to maybe, you know, even avoid sometimes situations there that what we can do. So, you know, it's nice to see this kind of stuff come out. And I know that, um, that Audi is putting a lot of money into this, into research and stuff. So we'll have to wait and see what happens and where where they plan on deploying this vehicle. So I'll keep watching that. And if anybody has more information where they think that this thing's going to end up, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Quickly going to talk about the Jaguar I-PACE. It's won some more awards. And I know, you know, last time I reported on some awards, I think I tweeted it and I got some really nasty comments. Oh, why is Jag Jaguar getting all these awards? Well, they're not paying people. I mean, maybe sometimes they manufacturers do, but I mean, they're getting a lot of awards and they've just got the design green car and top uh, and the top world car of the year awards. And that's quite significant for green car and design. Um, uh, you know, they've, they've already received numerous awards with the I-PACE, um, including European car of the year back in March. Uh, I think it's a great vehicle. I mean, you know, it's certainly beyond my budget, but uh, it's a lovely vehicle. It's It's got a lot of nice qualities to it, really high build quality. Yeah, it's not the most efficient, but it's certainly got a fun factor. And I'm looking I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to get into one quite soon, uh, hopefully later on this spring or before or into the early summer where I can spend a little bit more time than I did with the I-PACE then just uh, at the launch event last year on a closed test track. I'll be able to drive that around. So congratulations to the gains on, on Jaguar. You know, um, they're out there doing things. I've been saying all, all along, folks, keep watching Jaguar because they're taking electrification very seriously. They are going all in as well as a lot of other manufacturers happening. In fact, their design guys quoting as the going green was going to happen to the whole industry and that they are just starting their journey into that. So they, there's going to be a lot of electrification from Jaguar coming. So keep watching that, especially if you're a Land Rover fan. Hint, hint. I'm not giving any spoilers. I'm just saying something could happen there. Keep your keep watching them and congratulations to Jaguar. And finally, one last tidbit of uh, concept that came out from the Genesis, which is another Kia brand, of course, the Genesis high-end brand for Kia. Something called the uh, Mint, just Mint. I was thinking there was another name, but it's just a Mint. A two-seater electric city car. Um, you know, pretty pretty cool, I think. Um you know, it's it just these are just concept pictures that have been floated out there. There's no other details other than they expect it to be at least 200 miles of range, and be able to be offered with up to 350 kilowatt hour kilowatt fast charging capability. Excuse me. Um, so that's about all they say, uh, and it's a minimalist approach to the interior because it's a two seater kind of coupe. Uh, sports coupe there that's going to be barreling around I'm sure it'll have a lot of get up and go and if they actually build this thing a nice looking car so you know um, we'll have to see what happens there but again as I reported when I covered the Toronto show about the Kia uh, Essentia if I remember correctly that that was that coupe that was out there a lot of this design language could go down to future vehicles and Kia again is putting more money and effort into R&D and engineering so you see this mint come out
All right, I have a quick mailbag segment. Hey, love mailbag. Thank you very much for sending me information. This was actually through a comment on YouTube, uh, and I thought the question was pretty relevant, so I thought I'd bring it up. It was uh, one of the uh, uh, YouTube followers uh, by the uh, nickname of Spuddy. Thank you very much, Spuddy, for giving me this question. He basically, he or she asked about etiquette when you're charging. So uh, he owns a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, and he's been told by some people that you should not plug you should not charge a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle in a level three charging area um, that should only be reserved for full battery electric vehicles uh, so he i guess he's got he or she has got some slack about that flack about that um, basically they're saying that they shouldn't shouldn't be allowed to charge your card any public charger um, because they can because you can drive the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle on fuel or petrol so why do you need to charge it up um, so he's uh, he or she has asked me. Spuddy has asked me about um, uh, you know uh, they can't drive effectively on on Bev mode outside of the city. They use 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 this car mainly for urban transportation during the weekdays at least. But because the the uh, the person mentions that they have a lot of appointments that they go on, which are within the within a nice small range. So uh, full battery only mode works well, and they have the fuel for weekend getaways and all that kind of stuff that they can go on. So um, where should I be pinned? permitted to charge my car is the actual question here. Well, I responded, but I'm going to bring this up and tell a lot of people, I think if any of you folks are out there telling plug-in hybrid electric vehicles that they should not charge in a public charger, uh, you need to get some, your brains checked, I guess. That's not cool. Um, the whole purpose of getting into bad electric vehicle folks is to, to drive them, is to drive on zero emissions. And you can't be selective um, on because you have a full electric vehicle, you should be able to charge because you have a plug-in hybrid, you don't because you have an engine you could run in. But a lot, as I mentioned, plug-in hybrids serve a good purpose. We don't have the choice and the abundance of electric vehicle, full electric vehicle products on the marketplace yet. That will cover the entire mass market spectrum. We're, we're years and years away from that still. So we need plug-in hybrids. They're a good stopgap measure, especially when they have a battery that's big enough for, for a, a good decent use case on a daily basis and by the way that this person was describing their their driving dynamics and characteristics they were using this vehicle uh, this plug-in hybrid mainly in battery mode for most of their their daily driving within the city uh, going to appointments but wanting to have the the time to be able to charge up to continue doing that and i think that that's what they should be doing because again, we want to be driving these vehicles not emitting any greenhouse gases as minimal as possible. So if you can, you can do full battery electric and you can go to a charger and, and sit there for 20 minutes or half an hour and then keep going, all the power to you. You should be able to do that. So um, for those that have told this person that they shouldn't have, uh, that I don't think is a cool thing to do. And, and I fully believe that if you have a even a partially battery powered uh, vehicle, you should try to take advantage of that as much as possible. Um, there, there is different charging etiquette about you know leaving your car there and it's been charged for five hours and you walk away that kind of thing and it's still there. There's those kinds of things which which are different. But in this case, where people are telling this person that they shouldn't be public charging at all, I think is wrong. So, you, Spuddy, you keep going with your car. You keep going and trying to, to drive as much within the zero emissions mandate as you can. I really appreciate that. And I applaud you for bringing this question to me and thank you very much. And I hope that this is, you know, given some people that might have a negative slant on this, a little bit different perspective and viewpoint. Because again, folks, we're all in this. You might have got an EV for different reasons, but the underlying main factor of this movement is to lower greenhouse gas emissions. And the, trans the consumer-based transportation sector is a big, big uh, area producer of greenhouse gas emissions every year. It's not the only, there are other industries and other producers of that, other markets that contribute, but this is a big one. And this is where you and I as lowly consumers have the ability to affect some change, positive change by adopting an EV. And that includes a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle if it makes sense for you. So thank you very much for the question. I appreciate it. And again, please continue to email me if you've got other questions. And uh, the ones that I think are good for a lot of people to understand, I'll try to bring up on the show.
All right, well, that's it for episode 41, almost Fast and Furious. I'm trying to get these a little shorter. Don't forget about the... Uh, thank you very much for watching, by the way. And again, uh, trying to educate uh, minds one tailpipe at a time is the motto that I go for. Now, don't forget about the fully charged info, which I have up here quickly. If you go to their website, the June thing is coming up. It's only about a month and change away. And I'm excited to be uh, going out there to see a lot of folks in June. And don't forget about the US one. There should be information on their fully charged website about that. Um, again, thanks everybody for watching, for uh, commenting, for liking or not liking. If you don't like, I always get a few dislikes on my shows, no matter what. There's always a few, and, and I know I can't satisfy everybody. And uh, you know, I try to try to make these informative and give you some some of my opinions where it makes sense. And uh, not, I know it, not everybody's going to agree or like it, but hey, that's the world we live in, and I respect that. And I do thank you for comments, uh, whether they're positive or negative. And of course, uh, those who are helping me via Patreon, I'm always humbled. Thank you very much for that. It's very much appreciated to keep me doing what I'm doing here. Uh, and don't forget, uh, again, to subscribe to the show if you haven't and tell others about it. I appreciate that, getting the word out. All my contact information is coming up in the end credits. And the thank yous, of course, are Patreon. And so until next time, please, everybody, stay safe. Um, this is uh, just coming out on the Easter weekend. So for those who celebrated it, I hope you have a great Easter weekend. The long weekend for a lot of you. And I look forward to the next show and to see some people. I'll be doing some more uh, meetings and public interaction the next week. I'm going out to three different events, uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing some people there. But until next time, everybody, please stay safe and we'll see you then. Bye bye.